Aramax highlights. Coming up on the show. In concert, top Turkish pianist Fazil Say performs in Germany. Gourmet gathering. Lovers of fine food meet up at the Rheingau Gourmet and Wine Festival. Small sensations. Artist Robert Gulpen makes miniature cars with a difference. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Karen Helmstedt. Greetings from Berlin and welcome to our Highlights edition. And we start off with a tribute to one of the greatest fashion designers of the last century, the one and only Yves Saint Laurent. And where Coco Chanel might have liberated women in the context of their clothing, he gave them the power to dress in a man's world. Well, the last time he himself graced the catwalk was in 2002, and in 2008 he died at age 71. It was the end of an era, and yet his influence lives on, and at a brand new New retrospective of his work in Paris, we spoke to some of those who knew him best. It's the first time the Petit Palais, an art museum near the Champs Elysees, is being used to exhibit a fashion designer. The opening of the show featuring the great Yves Saint Laurent was hosted by the designer's partner of many years, Pierre Berger. He explains why this retrospective means so much to him. It gives people an opportunity to understand the complete work of Yves Saint Laurent, which also had a social dimension. Fashion isn't interesting if it's only there to dress rich women. Yves Saint Laurent also wanted to go beyond that with his designs. Three hundred selected designs, as well as photos, films and drawings, document 40 years of Yves Saint Laurent's work. It's a trip through time and fashion history. Yves Saint Laurent started out in the 1950s with his first designs for Dior and ended his career with a spectacular farewell show in 2002. This is also very emotional for me. I see before me my entire life with Yves Saint Laurent. When I see the dresses that he made for Dior, I remember how we got to know each other back then. Pierre Berger and Yves Saint Laurent lived together for 50 years. Another of the designer's most trusted companions was his muse and confidant, Betty Catru. When I met Yves for the first time, I was already dressed like a boy. I wore jeans and pants. But he transformed my style into something wonderful. He created real suits for me, a tuxedo. I was very lucky. Yves Saint Laurent was the first designer who understood how to dress women in masculine style clothes and still allow them to be feminine and seductive. He presented his first tuxedo for women in 1966. It was a revolutionary step that many women appreciated. Women like me, who prefer to wear men's clothes, were really happy with Yves Saint Laurent. I wore nothing but his creations for 20 years. Yves Saint Laurent produced many sensations, including his safari jacket, and thrilled admirers with creations inspired by Russian, African, and Chinese elements. He was also famous for designs that called to mind paintings by Piet Mondrian, or Vincent van Gogh. One room is dedicated to the amazing colors that Yves Saint Laurent loved to use. He was an artist, but he always knew that fashion is more than art. He was an artist faced with a limitation, and that limitation was a woman's body. He always remembered that his creations had to be wearable. The exhibition offers exclusive insights. Visitors can peer into the wardrobe of French actress Catherine Deneuve, or look at a recreation of Yves Saint Laurent's studio, and the table where he drafted his designs. You can really imagine how Yves Saint Laurent sat at his desk and worked, and you can also see it in archive photos. That's what brings this retrospective to life. Admirers of Yves Saint Laurent include many established fashion designers like Jean-Paul Gaultier of France and Germany's Wolfgang Jopp. 
Both still see him as a role model and an inspiration. He had an incredible talent, a modernity and sensuality. But beyond that, he was able to combine feminine and masculine elements in a brilliant way. He was the master. What he did was ultra-modern, and it's still modern. You could say this man wrote fashion laws that will apply forever. The Yves Saint Laurent exhibit at the Petit Palais runs until the end of August. A unique opportunity to enter into the realms of a master designer and a step into the world of real haute couture. Turkey's internationally renowned Fazıl Say is one of those multi-talented wonders who manages to be pianist, composer and a major force in world music all at the same time. Well, since 2006, he's made an even bigger name for himself here in Germany as artist in residence at the Konzerthaus in Dortmund. And this week, a four-day focus on his work also underscored the cultural capital status shared this year by Germany's Ruhr Valley and Say's home city of Istanbul. Dortmund is celebrating Turkish musician Fazil Say. Each of his four concerts is a highlight, including the chamber music performance. Say and the Dortmund Konzerthaus have worked closely together since 2006. It was love at first sound. My first impression was, that's Mozart. Das spielt Mozart. The music flows in him, flows through him. It just doesn't stop. He's almost a kind of medium. It's so spontaneous. Maybe Mozart was like this, full of music. Maybe Mozart was music. Fazil is something like music too. Time and time again, Fazil Sai has been called a genius as a pianist and a composer. I've been composing and playing the piano since I was five. It's in my nature. I'm very used to doing these things, doing both of them. has composed a symphony about his home city, Istanbul. But the idea came from Dortmund, from the Konzerthaus director. If you really want to capture the spirit and the sound of this city and express that through modern music, Fazıl Say is the person to do it. When I asked, he said, of course I'll do it. And that's how the Istanbul Symphony came about. <laughs> The world premiere is taking place in Dortmund, but rehearsals are held in Cologne, home of the WDR Symphony Orchestra. It's Sai's first symphony, and he composed it for a large ensemble. It's for an orchestra of more than 100 musicians, plus a few movements feature musical solos performed on Turkish instruments. To me, it's really a romantic piece of music because it embodies that feeling I get from Istanbul, the nostalgia. That's also partly romantic. Symphonies usually have four movements, but the Istanbul Symphony has seven. The reason is simple. In Turkey, we say that Istanbul is the city with seven hills. Contemporary compositions, the basic musical building blocks, are often difficult to identify, but not here. The symphony we've just started working on is motivated by a completely different idea. 
It works with recognizable motifs that will be easy to sing. The rhythm's also extremely catchy, and there's a lot of repetition. You could dance to it in parts or at least move along to the rhythm. Back in Dortmund at the chamber music concert where Fazis Sai is performing on stage. At the world premiere of his Istanbul Symphony, however, he'll be taking a seat in the audience. Well, this week also saw the International Tourism Fair, or ITB, here in Berlin. And one of the obvious trends to be seen there was the growing popularity of gourmet tours with a special focus on regional European cuisine. Now, here in Germany, many regions are increasingly looking to attract serious gourmets, which make up about 3% of all tourist traffic. And that figure is on the rise, and that's very clear at the successful Rheingau Gourmet and Wine Festival in Hattenheim, where for 6,000 blissful guests, Guests, good food and drink are the spice of life. The Rheingau region is famous for its fine wines and its picturesque scenery. Rolling hills and vineyards line the River Rhine and the region is dotted with quaint villages offering a large number of inns and restaurants. One of them is the Kronenschlösschen Hotel. It's open all year round, but for the last 14 years, the highlight of the annual calendar is the Rheingau Gourmet and Wine Festival. A two week long event that attracts some of the world's top chefs and vintners. Host Hans Burkhard Ulrich gives all his guests a warm welcome. He attributes the public's growing interest in gourmet food to the many cookery shows on TV. Millions of people must be watching, otherwise there wouldn't be so many of these shows. And all these people want to try out all this great food for themselves. They want to visit the chef's restaurants and see what his cooking really tastes like. Only the best is served up here, but it does come at a price. The average menu costs about 200 euros, but the wine is included. We have a lot of guests who tell me that in order to come here and afford this truly exceptional dining experience, they don't mind missing out on one or two less exciting dinners. Many gourmets come back year after year and enjoy not just one, but several culinary treats. This is the sixth time I've attended the Rheingau Gourmet Festival. I attend two or three events every year. It's always an experience and we enjoy it wholeheartedly. But it's also demanding. After three days you're exhausted and you need a holiday. The hotel puts its entire kitchen staff at the disposal of the chefs cooking at the festival. Patrick Kimpel, head of the Kronenschlösschen kitchen, helps out too, but also serves up his own festival menus. He says Germany is definitely home to first-class cuisine. There are so many opportunities in Germany. There's more top-class food here in so many different varieties than ever before. Johannes King is a three-starred chef who works on the North Sea island of Zylt. He favors fresh, homegrown ingredients. What I'm making here is pumpernickel mustard, which I'll serve with the cod in shrimp sauce. It should taste of pumpernickel, pure and simple. Johannes King says in this case, gourmet tourism means both the guests and the chefs are prepared to travel. This is a place where gourmets can get together. We work all week, and in our free time, this is what we do. We work. But it's all about enjoyment, and it's wonderful to find like-minded people, be they colleagues or guests. It's a great form of tourism that should definitely flourish. Within Germany, celebrity chef Jean-Claude Bourgoy has been something of an ambassador for French cuisine for 40 years. 
Fine dining is part of the national culture in France and Germany. You can find it in places like Baden-Württemberg. Families still cook together. Even young girls can cook. I've seen young trainees cook so well, they were even able to motivate me. They might not have the techniques, but they're passionate about what they do. But is it possible to remain passionate in all this chaos? With some 240 menus leaving the kitchen every day, every single dish needs to be flawless, so skill and perfectionism are the order of the day. But not much is left over, and the chefs themselves have to make do with a no-frills supper. Spätzle, lentils and sausage. We need to eat too, right? Absolutely. Bon appétit. Well, many of the boys who played with dinky cars when they were children, and because bigger boys just need bigger and more expensive toys, it's not very surprising that Robert Gülpen from Chiemsee in southern Germany has no trouble finding a market for his work. Gülpen specializes in model cars, but with a difference, namely a gold or platinum plated difference, such that many of his model versions can easily cost as much as a real car. A body and interior made of gold. Perfect replicas produced on a scale of 1 to 18. Robert Gupin sells his miniature cars all over the world. He says he's carved out his very own niche market. Customers are looking for individuality. They want a model that's fully customized, and that's what we offer, either as a one-off or as a limited edition of up to 500 models. Robert Gülpen was at the International Motor Show in Geneva when Volkswagen CEO Martin Winterkorn was named Automotive Manager of the Year 2009. His prize was a model Bugatti Veyron made by Robert Gülpen. A model of the fastest series-built sports car in the world, produced on the scale of 1 to 46 and with a platinum surface. I think the prize in general is tremendous, and the gift is even better. I've rarely seen such a perfectly made miniature car. Just look at the bodywork, and believe me, I know what I'm talking about. It's extraordinary. Back in his workshop in southern Germany, Robert Gülpen casts the model by hand with precious metals heated to 360 degrees Celsius. The measurements are based on the car company's original data. The painstaking filigree work can take months to complete. Robert Gülpen can also create models out of gold and platinum, if customers so desire. A qualified mechanical engineer, he's been perfecting his technique for over 15 years. I worked on the development of an original Mercedes, and I wanted to have this car as a model, made of precious metal or plated with precious metal. But you couldn't buy that sort of thing. But I really wanted it, so I started designing my own model car, using my own tools, and I cast it myself. Over the years, I improved the casting technique, and that's how I got where I am today. The major car companies regularly order a series of up to 500 model cars from Gopen, which they give to special customers as gifts. A single model is made up of some 300 individual parts. Even as a small boy, Gopen loved cars. Today, he spends a lot of time studying the originals before starting work on his miniature replicas. My first encounter with the original is always very important because I try to convey the intensity embodied by the original in the model. 
äh, ich dann versuche zu übertragen in so ein Automodell. Das the emotional charge of a real car seeps through the whole production process and influences the model in its entirety. durch und beeinflusst das Modell an jeder Stelle. Robert Gulpin is an artist who makes miniature masterpieces from gold. His models cost between 1,000 and 20,000 euros, complete with appropriately stylish packaging. And now to art of quite a different kind. Klaus Buri certainly isn't a household name for anyone living outside of Germany, but his large-scale architectural sculptures are enough to fascinate even the biggest skeptics. Since 1979, the Frankfurt native has been experimenting with a very minimalist type of structural sculpture, mostly in open spaces. And his latest show in Nuremberg shows how dramatic changes of direction have continually expanded his professional scope. Klaus Buri chose his hotel room in Nuremberg for a reason. From here, he can keep a close eye on his latest artwork. You can tell it was made especially for this place. And you can sense that the feeling I had for the height and width and length were just right. I'm really happy about this structure. Klaus Puri's latest sculpture, the Nuremberg Rest Stop, is located on the square in front of the museum. It invites passers-by to stop and take a closer look. They can even walk right into the structure. It's made up of filigree columns, and the form is reminiscent of ancient temples. This is just basically a rough cut spruce wood. The raw feeling is supposed to be in direct contrast to the precise facades on the building behind it. It has a feeling of being raw, temporary, a sculpture with its own form and language. Inside the museum, visitors take a journey through a collection of the artist's works that span his career. It starts out with jewelry. His ornate pieces earned him international fame in the 1970s. Anyone who owns some of Bourri's work keeps a close eye on it, like this American collector. Bourri was inspired by 60s pop culture when he designed this colorful plexiglass jewelry. And here, the influence of architectural design is evident. He also experiments with metal alloys. In time, Bourri's works became more sculptural until he finally moved onto bigger dimensions. That was really a significant step for me. I was working with small designs and I decided to throw caution to the wind and take a risk. I hadn't planned to be a sculptor and I had no training. So I had to learn how to do everything on my own. No, I'm happy I made the decision I did. As a sculptor, his designs are inspired by architectural forms. This greenhouse for thought is a walk-in piece of art. Many of his works are open to public display for a limited time period. Only scaled-down models of the original structures are left behind. Bitterfeld Arch in a former coal mining area is considered his greatest work. When you're on the balcony that kind of protrudes outwards, you have the feeling that you can fly like Icarus. It allows your thoughts to roam. He's fascinated by architecture, especially in its most ephemeral form. He calls this photo series of haystacks farm architecture. This is a wonderful it's a beautiful dialogue between the simple structures, the landscape, and the light. It's something I'll always find fascinating.
Klaus Burri's rest stop in Nuremberg is staying put until June, but then the journey will continue. And I'm afraid our journey has come to an end for this edition. But before we go, just a quick reminder that you can find our highlight reports and lots more online. Just go to youtube.com slash Deutsche Welle English. And that is all one word. So until we meet again, from myself and the entire Euromax team, thanks for watching. Take good care and tschüss. <laughs>